Hey now, so I did say in my Terror of Mechagodzilla video that I would do a separate video on ranking the Showa era Godzilla movies. At first, I was going to take some time to think about it, but honestly, this list is not definitive for me anyway. My feelings about these movies change a lot. So in a few years, I might feel differently, but for now, this is a general idea of how I'd rank them. The second half of this video will sort of be a little segue into the Heisei era. I'll talk about a few things that occurred between 1975 and 1984, as I've read about a lot more interesting things that happened during that time. So I plan to put this video between Terra of Mechagodzilla and the Return of Godzilla on my YouTube playlist. But first, let's get to the rankings. I was tempted to do one of those tier lists that have become very popular, but for consistency's sake, I'll rank these like I did the other eras. Maybe when I attempt to rank all the movies together, I will just resort to the tier style because that's going to be a challenge. Now I want to point out I'm basing the rankings on a combination of my enjoyment of the movies and the sentimental value I have towards them. It's now impossible for me to see these movies the same after making my history of videos, so that definitely has an influence here as well. But I am not basing these rankings off of some sort of objective standard or popularity. I know some people don't think art can be objective at all, and that's a debate people have, but I tend to think you can do it, sort of. It's just a different way of judging the art. But anyway, that is not how I am judging these. I just wanted to point that out. And please, feel free to rip me a new asshole when you see this list, because I'm sure there are some things you're going to see here that you're not going to like. I've been sitting here for days! Start the damn joust before I piss myself! Now, let's begin. Number 15, Godzilla vs. Gigan. Damn him! Damn that man! I know what you're thinking. How is it not all monsters attack. And also, I'm fully aware that this movie, Godzilla vs. Gigan, is popular with a lot of fans, so I am ready to take my beating in the comments. If you watched my video on this movie, you already know I found this to be just sort of a drag. Even the fight at the end bored me to tears. The idea on paper of Godzilla and Eggla Dukla Dillo, Angelus, Angerus, whatever you want to call him, teaming up to fight two other monsters sounds tremendous, actually. But I just didn't enjoy how it was executed, and overall the cheap feel of the movie bothered me more than the others. I did like the numerous oddball characters, but ultimately this movie I've now reviewed twice, and each time, whether it's the English dub or the original Japanese version, I practically fall asleep every time. Only thing that kept me awake was legs over here. And I know Gigan's a cool villain and this was its first movie, but that wasn't enough for me. Especially when Ghidorah seemed like a shell of itself. Makes me sad to put this at number 15 considering it was legendary suit actor Haro Nakajima's last time playing Godzilla in a movie. Number 14, Godzilla vs. Megalon. Now I'm attacking Jet Jaguar. Have I gone crazy? I know. I just have to say it, I personally don't like the more corny or campy Godzilla stuff. It's just not my thing. And this movie is the king of camp. It's probably why I'm more of a Heisei-era guy. Sure, we get a lot of memes out of this movie, but it's just not something I want to go out of my way to watch. I enjoy the Jet Jaguar character, of course, and I got a kick out of how much the suit actor, Sugutoshi Komada, loved playing the character. Honorable mention to Robert Dunham as well for his tremendous performance as a drunk casino grandpa who controls a giant beetle. This may be low on my list, but I do recognize how influential this movie was to American audiences with the NBC primetime airing, cementing Godzilla as the king of camp in the United States for decades. Number 13, All Monsters Attack, or Godzilla's Revenge. There we go, I know you were all waiting, when the hell am I going to put this one on here? In a movie franchise that is often derided as being repetitive, this one bucked the trend. As I already said in my video on this movie, I by no means am trying to say this is some sort of high art piece with an undeserved bad reputation. This movie isn't really enjoyable to me in a conventional sense, but it's oddly intriguing because of the history behind it, and if you watch the original Japanese version, it's much easier to digest. The English dubbing is an abomination. If we were doing this list based on the dubs, then this would probably be number 15. 
But after learning what Honda was truly trying to do with this movie and giving an honest rewatch when I did my video on it, I do think it's worthy of slight praise for taking a bad situation, a la a minuscule budget, and managing to turn it into a movie that executes its message rather well. The message being one that still rings true today. That a lot of parents in first world countries are no longer able to raise their own kids. The rise of the two-income household has changed how kids are raised, and Ichiro represents that. And treat them like trash! Call the police, I'll man. tell you what you get! Call the police! <laughs> it's also worth noting that this was one of Honda's favorites. Number 12, Godzilla Raids Again. The second Godzilla movie has always been looked at historically as this sort of letdown after the amazing first Godzilla. For some reason, as a kid, I would always stop watching the movie after Godzilla destroyed Osaka. Maybe I just had a terrible attention span. I don't know. One day, I sat my ass down and finally watched the whole thing, and I found the Hokkaido battle to be hypnotizing. I was so drawn in by it. I loved the idea of them burying Godzilla slowly for whatever reason. I just, I don't know. I liked how it looked. As an adult, this movie keeps things interesting with all the different locations. The movie has a start at Iwato Island, and then we move to Osaka, then eventually Hokkaido. I believe this is the first movie to show two giant monsters battle in a city. A first that we would see many times after that. One mistake I'd like to correct from my video on this movie is, though I didn't see it written anywhere while making the video, some who lived through the 1960s pointed out in my comment section that this movie was in fact broadcasted on television in the United States during that decade. And on a personal note, I recently got to go see Osaka Castle, which, of course, because of this damn movie, my first thought was, hey, where's Godzilla and Anguirus? Anguillosaurus, killer of the living. Anguillosaurus. True. Number 11, Godzilla vs. Hedera. Yes, Yoshimitsu Bano's masterpiece. You have Godzilla flying, weird shit happening. Just a, uh, just a, just an absolute oddity here. I didn't like watching this movie as a child, but I enjoyed it quite a bit when I watched it a few months ago. Definitely strange, but it reminded me a lot of the original Godzilla. A serious message was being put forth, but the movie's tone is all over the place. Godzilla in 1954 was a bleak affair where smiling is basically not allowed and laughing will get you killed. But here, Bano leaves room for all sorts of expression. Bano gets remembered for making Godzilla fly, even naming his memoir, The Man Who Made Godzilla Fly. But to me, Bano did something far more important. He showed that a Godzilla movie doesn't have to always have the same subtext. A Godzilla movie can always be made to fit the times and to articulate society's issues. Whether it's the fear of atomic destruction, rampant pollution, or bureaucratic red tape. Number 10. Son of Godzilla. I know a lot of people hate Minya, especially how he was first shown, which is quite disturbing. But I have to admit, I find this movie to be entertaining. It's obviously silly at times, and Godzilla looks like absolute dog shit. What's this over here? It's dog shit. Dog shit, that's great! But the fights are fun. And I'm not gonna lie, Beverly Maeda is easy on the eyes. Unlike the villain of the movie, who's truly terrifying for us folks who don't like spiders. The movie's final battle looks awesome with the snow coming down and the ending is heartwarming if you let yourself forget how bad Godzilla looks as he hugs a professional wrestler in a monster suit. Number nine, Ebira, Hara of the Deep. I guess it's fitting I keep the island movies together. I kind of had the same reasons for liking this one as Son of Godzilla. An entertaining story with an island setting, you have cool fight aesthetics, I will always love the fight with Ebira and the set they use for it. Just like Maeda, Kumi Mizuno looks stunning, and despite Godzilla not waking up until over halfway into the movie, it manages to keep my attention without the temptation of wanting to fast forward. Number 8, Invasion of Astro Monster. First thing that'll always pop in my mind when Invasion of Astro Monster is brought up is Kumi Mizuno in that alien getup. Despite the monster action being limited, the movie is lifted by the introduction of the Zillions. Fine performances from Nick Adams and Akira Takarada, and of course, when Godzilla was on screen, it was just downright awesome to see him fighting on another planet with his ally, Rodan. 
As a kid, I liked this movie a lot, and as an adult, it still holds up for me. Number seven, Destroy All Monsters. This movie is a celebration of the show era up to that point, and for the most part, it delivers on the monster action. Getting together most of the different monsters from the Toho universe in one movie must have been really exciting for the kids back in 1968. In my video, I talked about Honda's original plan for this movie, which sounded so much more interesting, sort of a Jurassic Park before Jurassic Park. Either way, it's an entertaining watch that packs into it everything we love and hate about the show era. Maybe not the most original story, but entertaining nonetheless. Number six, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. This might be the Godzilla movie I watched the most when I was younger. It truly is an epic movie. Godzilla fails to destroy Mechagodzilla in the first fight and gets badly injured. But then later, with a new ability in his back pocket, him and King Caesar take it down. King Caesar. King Caesar is probably my favorite monster outside of Godzilla. The movie just has so many memorable moments, too. A lot of the imagery is sheared into my mind. The King Caesar song seems to go on forever, but the whole concept of a Korean woman singing in Japanese to act as an alarm clock for a giant dog lion is so grandiose and hilarious, it's hard for me to not rank this movie so high. A highly explosive addition to the Showa era and in my mind, a comeback of sorts for Godzilla in the 1970s, as I didn't like Godzilla vs. Gigan or Godzilla vs. Megalon. Number 5. Mothra vs. Godzilla Mothra vs. Godzilla brought together two popular monsters off the heels of King Kong vs. Godzilla two years before, the difference now being that these were exclusively Japanese monsters. The whole gang is basically all there. You have the cute Yuriko Hoshi, Akira Takarada, Hiroshi Koizumi, Kenji Sahara, Jun Tazaki, Yu Fujiki, and you can't forget the Peanuts playing the Shobujin, Emi and Yumi Ito. Tsuburaya's awesome Mothra marionette wouldn't be rivaled until almost 40 years later in Godzilla Tokyo SOS. Haro Nakajima's performance as Godzilla was tremendous, and that suit with the angry expression is perfect. As I was talking about earlier, if this list was an objective ranking list where I was removing my feelings from the discussion, then this movie would probably be either number two or number three. But it goes to number five for a very petty reason. Godzilla Lost. Number 4. King Kong vs. Godzilla So the same thing I just said applies to this movie. Extremely popular, well made, a lot of fun to watch, but I've always seen this movie as Godzilla losing. Yeah, yeah, I know, all the theories and headcanon and all the bullshit surrounding this. I already talked about the official canon position on this, or at least Tanaka's position on this, that the fight is supposed to be a draw. Uh, you can watch my History of King Kong vs. Godzilla video if you want to hear me rehash all that, but I'm not going to do that here. Regardless, this movie has a bit of everything that fans of Kaiju Ega love. Godzilla is treated with respect and as something that should be feared, but also Tsuburaya got playful with it, much to the chagrin of Honda. Even as I make this video in 2023, it is still the most attended Godzilla movie of all time in Japan. One correction I'd like to make from my video, I stated the movie sold over 12 million tickets. That's when taking into account all the releases in Japan. It was put in theaters four different times. But if we're just talking about its first release in Japan, it sold over 11 million tickets. Number three, Terra of Mechagodzilla. This might raise some eyebrows, but for me, this was a simple one. As a kid, I didn't like it. As an adult, I love it. I love the story by Takayama, Honda's direction, and the new monster, Titanosaurus. The only part that I consider to be kind of lame is that Mechagodzilla seems like less of a threat. Tomoko Ai steals the show as Katsura, and I'm probably in the minority in loving the Dr. Mafune character. Godzilla also has a great entrance, and I think they do a good job of having Godzilla be a good guy, but also something humans need to be wary of. Something that the Heisei era would do perfectly, in my opinion. Sadly, as I said in my video, this is the Godzilla movie that did the worst at the box office. It deserved a much better fate. Nonetheless, with the darker tone and almost melancholy feel, Honda's last Godzilla movie is still one of my favorites. Now, as I was making this video, news came down that Yukiko Takayama, the woman who wrote the story and screenplay for this movie, passed away on June 2nd, 2023. 
Admittingly, it is a morbid coincidence for me as I spent last month making the Terror of Mechagodzilla history video. I send my prayers to her family and loved ones, and obviously as time passes, we will continue to see whatever human connections to these Showa-era movies pass away. I will always cherish Takayama's Terror of Mechagodzilla, and honestly, I see it as one of the best stories for a Godzilla movie ever. Rest in peace. Number two, Godzilla. You what? I know, I'm almost committing a crime not putting this as number one, but as you'll see, there's a reason for that. If you don't know already, hint hint, the reason was already mentioned in one of my videos. But anyway, the movie speaks for itself at this point. A lot of people consider it the greatest giant monster movie of all time, though I am sure many consider King Kong to have that title. Godzilla, of course, took inspiration from the 1933 classic. In my video on Godzilla, at one point I refer to King Kong as lighthearted. Now when you speak about a topic for 17 plus hours, you're going to say things that just don't quite come out right. Obviously, that movie is not lighthearted. Though, two things. The Skull Island scenes are a lot of fun, where Kong is fighting all the other giant creatures, so maybe that's what I was thinking about, because that's my favorite part of the movie, is when he's fighting all those monsters, and I think, wow, that's a lot of fun, so maybe that's what I thought when I said lighthearted. And to be honest, I think compared to the original Godzilla, almost every movie could be considered uh, less heavy to say the least. Godzilla is a dour movie. The dread of the monster hangs over the entire affair. Even when they kill the monster, nobody's happy. And though we know it as a starting point for the Godzilla franchise and the birth of a pop culture icon, at the time it came out, it was an artistic expression of the fear of atomic devastation, and more specifically, the Lucky Dragon number no. 5 incident. Tomiyuki Tanaka, Ishiro Honda, Eiji Tsuburaya, Haro Nakajima, Akira Ifakube, Akira Takarada, Momoko Kochi, Akihiko Harata, Takashi Shimura, and many others would help kick off the longest running film franchise in history. Number 1. Ghidorah, the Three-Headed Monster. Ghidorah, Ghidorah, Three-Headed Asshole, however you pronounce its name, the movie named after our favorite three-headed dragon is my number one Godzilla movie of the Showa era. The reason being, it is the first Godzilla movie I ever saw, and I was completely taken in by it. Seeing this monster Godzilla teaming up with other monsters, Rodan and Mothra, to fight this giant creature that threatened them all was a sight to see. I didn't quite understand everything going on, like why there were tiny fairy women, but all I knew was, I wanted to watch more movies like this. When I watched it as an adult for the first time in a very long time, I still found it to be a great watch. The golden era of Kaiju Ega was still in full swing. You had the usual cast of familiar faces highlighted by the beautiful Akiko Wakabayashi. Each monster is given its time to shine, and the main three get reintroduced to the audience if you didn't happen to see them in their prior movies. This might also be the reason why I tend to like Godzilla movies where Godzilla is a threat to humanity, but in the end, he's needed to eliminate an even bigger threat. So yeah, there you have it. That's my rankings for the show era. I'm already questioning it, so again, don't think this is some concrete thing, but this is a general idea of where I rank everything. Please be encouraged to share your own rankings in the comments. Now, because I'm going to be putting this video in my History of Godzilla playlist on YouTube, let me do a little segue into the next era of Godzilla movies for those folks watching on the playlist. With the end of the Showa era, it only took a few years before Godzilla fans started demanding his return. According to John LeMay's book, there may have been a continuation of the Showa era already in the works. SOS Tokyo, Godzilla's suicide strategy, is what LeMay calls a mysterious script written not long after Terra of Mechagodzilla. It was written by screenwriter and novelist Hiroyasu Yamara. This story would involve Godzilla fighting a resurrected Gigan and a monster named Kamilagon, a mecha that can turn invisible. These monsters would be controlled by another group of aliens. For unclear reasons, this story idea would not be approved by Tanaka. In 1978, the Godzilla revival meeting began. Tanaka would get together a bunch of writers, old and new 
Tanaka would have writers take a look at an old idea, Bride of Godzilla, which was written in 1955 by Hideo Unagami, who also wrote the story of H-Man. The story was written after the release of Godzilla Raids Again. It had Godzilla's and Anguirus's backstory explored more, explaining that they lived in a hollow earth cavern. Scientists create a giant humanoid robot to defeat Godzilla just in case he gets out of his icy tomb from Godzilla Raids Again. The movie also includes a giant blood-sucking flea, which we'd sort of see get carried into the return of Godzilla in 1984. Scientists discover this hollow earth they theorized about and find another Anguirus, a giant bat, and mermaids. The Anguirus apparently gets killed later in the story by having its throat ripped out by the giant bride robot humanity built, because of course he does. Apparently Godzilla is attracted to the giant robot and they both start a mating ritual where they're killing the other monsters as a form of seduction. And I'll stop here because I feel like this is bullshit. <laughs> I, I actually thought I was being like messed with while I was reading this stuff. But this comes from John LeMay's research, and his book is tremendous on this stuff, so I trust it. Look it up. This is a thing. But anyway, Tanaka would have writer Hidechi Nagahara take a look at this Bride of Godzilla idea and have him rewrite it extensively, because he better have. He would write three drafts. Some include Godzilla's son, some include a female Godzilla, and... For some reason, the mermaids would be there too. Ultimately, Tanaka wouldn't like the drafts, but as I mentioned, the giant flea would live on in the mutated sea louse that we see in The Return of Godzilla. Even stranger than Bride of Godzilla would be Nobuhiko Obayashi's A Space Godzilla. The famous director is mostly known for the 1977 movie House. Obayashi's Godzilla story involves the monster washing up on the shore of Japan, dying of, I'm not joking, diabetes. I don't know how that's possible. He hadn't even come to America yet. This is where stuff gets even weirder. Scientists examine Godzilla's body and determine that what they call Godzilla is actually an alien named Rosan, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong, from the Godzilla planet. And Godzilla, or Rosan, is pregnant. It just keeps getting weirder from there, with them turning Godzilla or Rosan into a rocket ship and sending her home where she eventually defends her Godzilla planet from more aliens. Obayashi's intention was to use stop motion to make this whole idea come to life. This idea was considered in 1979, but ultimately rejected, thank the lord but it would be published and illustrated as a short story in Starlog magazine that same year. It would be illustrated by Katsuhiro Otomo, the eventual creator of the manga sensation Akira. In 1977, King of Monsters, Resurrection of Godzilla was submitted, with the plan being to have Godzilla fanboy Jun Fukuda to direct. However, this story wouldn't include any giant monsters for Godzilla to do battle with which Toho executives didn't like, so this would be scrapped as well. Then there's 1979's proposal, God's Godzilla, written by Yoshio Aramaki. In this idea, World War III is going on in the 1980s when aliens arrive and bring to life a creature named Godzilla, which is being controlled by one of the aliens who identifies as Jesus Christ himself. I am not joking. It's basically a Godzilla movie mixed with the Book of Revelation. The last one I'll talk about in this video is Godzilla Legend, the Asuka Fortress, written by our old pal Shinichi Sekizawa. In this treatment, Godzilla is now under control by humanity, which uses a radio frequency to keep the monster sedated underwater. A scientist creates a giant mountain-sized supercomputer named Asuka Fortress, or Big Boy as it's called in later drafts. As with most AI or supercomputer stories, the computer has its own ideas, and eventually becomes self-aware and starts attacking Japan. Humanity, in its desperation, awakens Godzilla, who battles it out with the fortress's robotic minions to save the Earth. This story would, of course, never be taken on by Toho, but I actually like this idea more than the other ones. There are more story ideas, but I talk about them in my Return of Godzilla video. 
As time went on and Godzilla wasn't on the big screen, a 10,000 member group of Japanese Godzilla fans calling themselves the Godzilla Resurrection Committee started to demand more Godzilla. The pressure was on for Tanaka to get this done. Next up, for those of you watching the playlist, we begin the Heisei era of Godzilla movies. For real this time. It's 1984's The Return of Godzilla. Enjoy. <laughs> 